awesome. Well, let's jump right into it. I have a, I have the agenda that we're going to be going over today. Let me share that out with everyone. This is the first in a series of webinars that uh, that I want to be doing. It's called the Diver Down series, and the reason I call it the Diver Down series is uh, it kind of reminds me of. Now, you, you see divers oftentimes fly this flag on their boats when they're submerged underwater. And uh, and and when they're submerged, this is sort of a warning to other ships that, hey, there's a diver down underneath the water. And I thought that's a great metaphor for what we're going to be doing. Uh, and that is we're going to be diving deep into some of these concepts. And I thought this would be the first, uh, a great first topic for this Diver Down series that we're going to be doing. Today, we want to dive deep into Cisco Unified Communications Manager. The communications, now I know some people call it call manager, but I'm kind of a stickler for that. It's not a call manager server. It's a communications manager server. Call manager is a service that runs on the communications manager server but sometimes I still mess it up and I still call it a call manager server from time to time. But uh, technically call manager, that used to be what we called it, uh, call manager now has just uh, been relegated to a service that runs on the Cisco Unified Communications Manager server. And by the way, as we're going through our presentation today, not gonna be able to see your questions during the presentation, but if you do have questions, please save those at the end and um, and, and we'll, do a, we'll do a little catch up here at the end, and I'll answer some questions toward the end of today's session. But let's get into it. Here's the agenda today. We want to start off with a review of Cisco Unified Communications Manager for those of you that don't use it, or maybe just a refresher for some of those uh, some of uh, those of you that do. But most of our session is going to be spent on doing the Communications Manager configuration out on the live interface. This morning, I, uh, I set this up with a brand new fresh install and uh, we are going to take that fresh install and we're going to get it up and running all the way to the point where we have phones that are able to call one another. And then we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. Those of you that don't know me, here's my super quick introduction. My name is, uh, is Kevin Wallace. I'm a double CCIA in uh, Cisco Collaboration and Route Switch. I've been working with Cisco Gear since around 1989, back with the old uh, Cisco AGS Plus. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but uh, that's where I started out. And I taught courses for a Cisco learning partner for nearly 14 years. And I was a network design specialist down at Walt Disney World in Florida. We had over 500 routers, literally thousands of Cisco Catalyst switches. And we, um, but it was just a great experience. We ran EIGRP all over the, uh, well, we ran EIGRP all over the campus. And I've written a bunch of books, done a bunch of uh, videos for Cisco Press, and I am thrilled to lead you through today's session. And I'm going to invite you to, to stay tuned at the end of today's session, because if you do, I've got a nice discount, um, kind of as a thank you for joining me for this uh, for this webinar live and uh, for your patience and sticking, uh, sticking with me through the technical issues at the beginning. I want to give you a nice discount on um, uh, another product that I just came out with. I just came out with a CCNA... Um, video series. It's uh, over seven hours long. I've also got a, CC, um, a CCNA in collaboration, I should clarify. I've also got a CCMP in collaboration video series, again, about seven hours. And if you're interested in those, if you want to go deeper in your collaboration studies with me, I've got a big discount for you. So let's uh, let's jump into it. Let's begin with this, uh, with our discussion of the Cisco Unified Communications Manager. By the way, if during today's session, uh, you, uh, the presentation seems to hang, just exit your browser, come right back into the room and we should be all good. And, uh, just doing a quick check to see, yeah, almost all of our attendees have now been able to, to rejoin us. So that makes me feel good. And, uh, I, and I am going to record this and send out, uh, send, uh, send out a recording link to you a little bit later today. So no worries about that. You'll probably get two recording links because they're sent out automatically. You're probably going to get that recording link for when things just didn't work. <laughs> That's about 20 minutes long. Yeah, feel free to delete that one. But uh, but I'll send you out a recording link of this good, uh, hopefully it's going to be a good webinar. But think of the Cisco Unified Communications Manager much as a PBX replacement. Now, back in the day, it was common for, uh, traditional, t uh, for uh, traditional companies would have a public branch exchange. 
this phone switch, a privately owned phone switch inside their company. And this gave them tremendous economies of scale. I remember I used to work with a local university and at that local university, we had, uh, we had about 6,000 phones, but we only had about 200 lines coming in from the local central office. And because of that, uh, we got, we got to save a lot of money on our phone bill. Think about that. Uh, 6,000 phones sharing 200 lines. Yeah. Instead of buying a phone line for everybody, we just got to share those lines because not everybody is going to be calling out to the public switch telephone network at exactly the same time. So we got to share those lines. And uh, that's sort of what the, uh, the communications manager lets us do. It lets us have a PBX replacement where phones can register. It's going to have the dial plans. It's going to have the intelligence. That's where we configure the features in our phones. Uh, just a few characteristics of this, by the way. The um, the communications manager server is it is server based. It's it's not like uh, you could almost think of it as an appliance because it's self contained in the server. Cisco fairly recently started supporting virtualization, so you can have it running in a virtual machine as well. But it is server based, and the underlying operating system is a Cisco flavor of uh, of Linux. Uh, you're not going to do your you're not going to use the VI editor in this and be editing files. It's a Cisco tweaked flavor of Linux. And let's say, for example, that these two phones on the screen want to call one another. We've got 2001. It wants to call 2002, and it's going to use a protocol called SIP or Skinny. In order to do that, SIP is a more of an industry standard protocol that stands for the Session Initiation Protocol. Uh, the uh, more Cisco proprietary uh, signaling protocol is the skinny client control, uh, control protocol, SCCP. Now, some phones can only run SIP. Some phones can only run skinny. Some phones can do both. For example, now I'm showing you on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm showing you... I'm showing you that uh, we've got this 9971 phone. And it only runs SIP, but let's just say that it's uh, just a generic IP phone. It's going to speak SIP or skinny up to the communications manager saying, hey, I would really like to place a call to 2002. Well, communications manager says, I know where that is. Let me contact 2002. I'll send a message, a skinny or a SIP message down to that. And we're going to be able to have this conversation. Uh, and once the call is set up, then here's an important point. Then we have the real-time transport protocol kick in, RTP. Notice that RTP goes directly between the phones. We're going directly between the phones. We're not going through the communications manager. We're going through, uh, we're not going through the communications manager. This is direct communication. And uh, then we can have packets flowing back and forth just between the phones. Now on screen, just for simplicity, I'm showing you a single communications manager server, but in reality, we typically have those servers uh, clustered together. We've got them clustered together. And by that, I mean, they share a database. We'll talk more about clustering in just a moment, but they share a database and clustering that gives us scalability. For example, the, the, the first communications manager server that comes to mind, I know one model that has a capacity of 7,500 IP phones. Well, you get four of those and suddenly you've got a, a cluster capacity of 30,000 IP phones in the same cluster. It's also give, it also gives us redundancy. One server goes down, another server can take over. Works pretty great like that. And something we're going to be setting up for you live today is a, a user. We, we typically, you don't have to, but we typically assign user accounts with our phones. That allows users to log into their own web page, set up some of their own phone features. And you're, you're going to love this. You ready? We could go into Communications Manager and add individual user accounts. We could do that. However, Many companies, they've already got user accounts created for everybody. They've got, um, I, I've asked this question to students for years, and they tell me that uh, the most common LDAP server they use is Microsoft Active Directory. Well, guess what? Communications Manager integrates with a variety of LDAP servers, including Microsoft Active Directory. So if you've already got 10,000 users created in your Microsoft Active Directory, let's just use that. We can integrate that 
with our communications manager. We can use that as our, as our single repository for user accounts. What a huge time saver that is. And you might say in my example, well, uh, the cluster example I gave it maxed out at 30,000 IP phones. Does that mean you can have no more than 30,000 IP phones? No, you can have more than that. You just might need to interconnect more than one cluster, or you could go out through a gateway. You can get out to the rest of the world. Some more protocols for you, if you're taking notes. The protocols that we typically use to speak between communications manager and a gateway would be MGCP, H.323, or SIP. The gateway then communicates out to the public switch telephone network using, uh, it might be some sort of a time division multiplexing circuit, like a like an ISDN PRI circuit. Oh, by the way, I just recently came out on my YouTube channel. If you don't follow me on YouTube, please check it out. It's, it's K Wallace CCIE. That's my YouTube channel. And, or just look for Kevin Wallace and you'll find my channel. I just recently came out with a very in-depth video on uh, E1s and T1s, how they work, the theory behind them, how to set them up. So that would uh, that would definitely be worth your while to, to check that one out. But the bottom line is IP phones register with communications manager using Skinny or SIP. They talk to one another using RTP. We can have multiple servers for scalability and redundancy, but we're not limited to that. One cluster can talk to another cluster. We can also go out to the rest of the world through a gateway. But let's focus in on this concept of a cluster for just a moment. A cluster, I said, is going to give us scalability. We can just add more servers to have more capacity. Or it could give us redundancy. It could literally allow one server to take over if another server goes down. But here's the way this, this shared database works. There's a uh, there's a SQL database that's running here, and out of all the servers in our cluster, we've just got one server that's designated as the publisher server. The publisher server has a read-write copy of the database, and uh, that is going to be sent out to subscribers. Subscribers have a read-only copy of the database. So if you go in and make a change, for example, today, we're going to be adding IP phones to this database. And when we add IP phones to the database, that update is going to be written to the publisher's database. But then the publisher is going to push out that update. It's going to push out that change. Hey, I've got a new IP phone created. It's going to push that out to the subscribers. Now, that's one type of communication happening within our cluster. It's not the only one, though. In addition to, in addition to that, we have what's called intra-cluster communication. If you want to put that in your notes, intra-cluster communication is real, I, I would call it real-time communication. Real-time communication between the servers in the cluster. So if a phone goes off hook and it's registered to one subscriber, everybody needs to know about that. So that intra-cluster communication, it's like a, it's like a full mesh of, uh, of connectivity between all the different servers in our cluster. All right, that's, that's the overview. I, I wanted to spend just a few minutes at the beginning of today's session to just remind you and, and make sure everybody's on the, on the same page regarding what is Cisco Unified Communications Manager. It's a server, phones register it with it. Uh, with it. it contains our dial plan, it contains our features, does so many things. In fact, I, I, I would say, I, I think it's safe to make this statement, I would say it is the most important concept in all of your collaboration studies the Cisco Unified, Commun Unified Communications Manager. But what I want to do now, and this is going to take up the bulk of our time together, I want to do a live demo for you. And this live demo is going to completely set up, obviously there's other things to set up on it, but it's going to completely set up a brand new Communications Manager install. I set it up just at the beginning of, uh, well, I set it up earlier this morning, brand new fresh install. And we're going to set it up using some best practice recommendations that I've learned over the years. And uh, we're going to get phones to call one another before it's all said and done today. So let's go out to that live demo. Now, I, I would encourage you to take some notes here because there are so many options in Communications Manager. I mean, what, what do we do first often comes to mind. This is the order in which I like to do things. The first thing I want to do, if you're taking some notes, is I like to go in and in a lab environment, which is what we're in right now, in a lab environment, the lab environment is going to be, I'd like to turn on all of my different features. 
just in case I need that feature for something I'm doing in the lab. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under navigation here and go into Cisco Unified Serviceability. I'm going to go into Cisco Unified Serviceability, and I'll say go. I have to get logged in. Go ahead and get logged in. And I'm going to go under tools and I'm going to say service activation. And notice we can see the different servers in my cluster here. Now, interesting point. This is new as of Communications Manager version 10. This is new as, uh, as of Communications Manager version 10. I've got my publisher server, I've got my subscriber server, and I've got my Cisco I am in presence server. Huh. That didn't used to show up in the cluster. Yeah, as of Communications Manager version 10, the, the, the I am in presence server is considered to be a part of the cluster. It's very tightly integrated with Communications Manager. We're not going to be setting that up today. That's in my training. But uh, today we're going to focus on these two servers in our in our cluster. Now I'm going to go into my publisher, first of all, and I'm going to enable all of my services except one. I don't want to I don't want to enable my DHCP server. Because, and the, re the reason I don't want to enable my DSC, uh, DHCP server is I don't want my phones to get an IP address too soon. I don't want them to try to register. I don't want them to try to register too soon. So what I'm going to do is say, I want to select all services. And I'm going to go down and say, I want to uncheck this one, the Cisco DHCP monitor service. Let's uncheck that one. Let's uncheck that one. And I'm going to say save. Now, this is going to take a little bit of time to do. So while it's turning on all those services, I've, I handily have another tab here. Let's see. Let me get logged in if I can to... My subscriber. And I'm going to go over to the serviceability screen here. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm turning on the services on the subscribers. Well, you'll see over on the publisher, it's still going. It still hasn't turned on all those services yet. They still say deactivated. So just to save some time here, I'm going to go over to my, subs uh, my subscriber select it, say go. And uh, yeah, I'm noticing some comments saying that you're getting a blurry screen. Yeah, that's uh, depending on your depending on your your internet connection. Yeah, the uh, the webinar software tries to kind of throttle down the uh, the the video quality. It's looking fine on my student view. So hopefully some people are seeing it nice, crisp and clear. Now, on my subscriber, I'm going to say check all services, but I'm going to uncheck the DHCP service, and I'm going to say save. And let's turn that on. Let's see. You see, we're still going over here on our publisher server. It's still not activated just yet, but that's all right. We can still, I've opened up yet another tab so we can start doing some things while we're waiting on all those services to activate. I'm going to get logged back in here. And again, let me try this again. I rebooted the server earlier. Need to reopen these windows. Whoop. Up in the right IP address, that would be helpful. Yeah, while it's still going, I want to show you the next thing I do with a fresh install. Here's the next thing I would do with a fresh install. Uh, and this is a Cisco recommendation as well. I want to remove DNS reliance. You see, by default, when your phones make a phone call, 
part of that lookup process when they're trying to get to their communications manager, uh, if they pre press the directories button on the phone, for example, it has to do a DNS lookup. Now, to me, I, I mean, DNS is great. It allows you to change the IP addresses of your communications manager servers. Certainly, we want DNS in, yeah, in, the, in the real world for looking up websites. But, but here, in my mind, adding DNS adds another potential point of failure. It's going to add another potential point of failure. And it's also going to, a little bit, it's going to slow down that lookup process. So Cisco actually recommends that we, that we don't do that. Cisco recommends that we remove DNS reliance. And let me show you how to do that if you're taking notes. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go under system and server, and let's do a find. You'll notice that my publisher server is known by a name. The first server you install gets known by a name. The next servers, they're known by their IP addresses. Now, I'm going to go into my subscriber server. Actually, I need to go into my publisher server. I'm going to go into my publisher server, and I'm going to change the name to the IP address. This is part of removing DNS reliance. It's not the entire thing, but this is part of it. I'm going to say it's 192.168.1.71. That's the IP address of my publisher server. And I'm going to save that. Oh, by the way, in the background, I've noticed that my services have been activated here. Took a little while. That's the reason I had another tab open so we could we could be busy doing other things while that was loading up. Now, the next thing we want to do, we're not done with removing DNS Reliance just yet. Some people th might think we are, but we're not at this point. There's something else we have to do. We're going to go under System. We're going to go under Enterprise Parameters and... Actually, actually, let me just have you take some notes on enterprise parameters because one of the first things I do when I when I set up a new system is I will I will go in and make some service parameter and enterprise parameter adjustments. One thing that I like to look at here is the auto registration phone protocol. We're going to manually add a couple of IP phones today, but there's an option for just having the phones boot up and dynamically getting a phone number from a pool of addresses or a pool of phone numbers. And if your phone is auto registering, remember I said it might be using skinny, it might be using SIP. You get to say right here, what, um, what protocol would you rather use? Which one would you prefer? I typically say skinny, but if you had a bunch of 9971s, they only speak SIP. You might want to select that as SIP, but I always like to check that one. Something else I want to do is this BLF for call lists. Not sure why, but it's disabled by default. I like to turn that on. What this is, BLF, that's the busy lamp field. That allows you to do what's called a native presence. It allows you to see if somebody's on the phone. It makes a light on your phone turn red. If they're on the phone right now, you know they're not available. I like to enable that feature. So I'll say BLF for call lists. But, but back to our discussion of removing DNS reliance, if we scroll down inside of enterprise parameters, you're going to see a series of URLs. You see all the authentication URL, directory URL, and so on. There's a bunch of URLs. You see right here, this is the name of my communications manager server. We want to get rid of the name and replace it with an IP address. And it's 192.168.1.71. Now I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to replace all instances of the server name with that IP address. We're going to replace all the instances of the server name with that IP address. And now I'm going to save that. That's what I do with my enterprise parameters. Now, just for good measure, normally when we make a massive change like this, I like to do a reset in case anything's going to be impacted by those uh, changes. So I'm going to do a reset right here. We'll close that. The next set of parameters that I like to do is service parameters. Now, a service parameter impacts a service. Remember I told you earlier that call manager was a service that you're running on a communications manager server. Yeah, let's go into uh, to the service parameters. And I'm going to do this on my publisher server. And notice all the different services that we have. We've got a lot of services to pick from, including the call manager service. That's the one that 
that we're mainly going to be focusing on. And for your notes, let me give you my best practice recommendations for setting up these service parameters. The first thing I like to do under my, under my service parameters is adjust a timer. I'm going to do a I'm going to do a find here, and I'm going to look for T three zero two. This is an interdigit timeout timer. You see, sometimes when we get into a, our discussion of dial plans, uh, and um, we might have a variable length dial plan, sometimes an international number, you're just not sure how many digits it's going to require to dial a number. So you might say, all right, let them dial any number of digits. Well, when they're done dialing, how does communications manager server know that it's know that it's okay to send the uh, to send the call out to the PSTN. It's got to wait for this timer to expire. And the default timer, I think, is too long. It's 15 seconds. You can see the default over here. Notice, huge point here, the, the unit of measure is in milliseconds, not in seconds. So when uh, I'm going to recommend you set it to three seconds, I've seen Cisco do it both ways. I've seen them say two seconds. I've seen them say three seconds. I normally do three seconds. Don't just type in three. You want to type in 3,000. 3,000 milliseconds is one second. And uh, there's another T302 timer. Let me just find it real quickly. And I'll set it to 3,000 milliseconds as well. That's one service parameter that I adjust. There's another one. Let me... Uh, I'm going to search for unallocated. Here we go. Notice that I've got four of these different parameters that begin with stop routing on. Stop routing on out of bandwidth flag. Stop routing on unallocated number flag. Stop routing on user busy flag. Stop routing on out of bandwidth flag here. In general, for most of my applications, I like to say false. I don't want to stop routing if any of this stuff happens. The default backup that you have built into your, we don't, we're not going to get into this today, but into your uh, into your route plan, where your route patterns point to route list, which point to route groups, that whole backup system, it doesn't work if you leave these at their default settings. So I'm going to set all these to false. Anything that begins with stop routing, I'm going to make sure that is set to false. Something else I like to turn on, is and not really sure why it's turned off by default is automated alternate routing automated alternate routing notice by default it's turned off i would like to enable it i think it's pretty cool what ha what this does is if i've got a central site and a remote site and phones at the remote site are calling back to the central site or, or vice versa if the wan bandwidth gets too busy if we say, sorry, there's no bandwidth available, I'm not going to be able to place the call over the IP WAN. This really cool feature will say, oh, I, I'm not able to call over the WAN. There's not enough bandwidth. No problem. I'll just call over the PSTN. We can use an alternate number to reach that same phone at the remote site. We're just calling over the PSTN. Love that feature. And I'm going to say true to make sure that, that we've got the option of using that. Now, the other features I like to, to enable here, it's, it's down toward the bottom. Here it is. It's under this mobility section, Cisco Unified Mobility, which, which I teach in the, in the courses I was telling you about earlier. Number one, I want, to, uh, I want to turn on this enterprise feature access. I'm gonna set it from false to true. Just in general, what this mobility feature does it allows you to have uh, another phone, like, like your cell phone. Your other phone, like your cell phone, your home phone, it can basically act like your, your office phone. You can go back, you can walk in from your car into your office and you're talking on your cell phone. You can just make that call seamlessly go over to your desk phone. Or you're about to leave your office, you can make that call seamlessly go over from your desk phone to your, to your mobile phone. Pretty amazing stuff. Uh, you can call it, you're on the golf course. You call in. Uh, you want to call a customer and you're calling from your cell phone. You call in to a special number and it says, hey, do you want to make a call? And you say, yes, I do. I want to call my customer at this number. When your customer gets your call, guess what their caller ID is? It's not your cell phone. I know you're out on the golf course. It's not your cell phone. They get, they get your desk phone number. It looks like you're in your office. Pretty amazing stuff.
But anyway, yeah, enterprise feature access, that means when you're on your cell phone, you can dial codes like star eight one, star eight two, star eight three. You can dial these codes to get access to enterprise feature uh, features. Something else that we'd like to turn on is um, mobile voice access. It's uh, that's the feature I was just telling you about, where we where we call into uh, where we call into a gateway. And we it calls out to a customer. I'm going to set this to true. Something else that uh, that I like to set up. I don't want to get too much into this discussion today, but remember I said you could call in from your cell phone into this number. Well, it recognizes that it's you based on your caller ID, and it says, "Hey, do you want to you want to call somebody?" And you say, "Yes, I want to call this customer." And it says, "All right, I'll call the customer and I'll make it look like I, it came from you." Well, we've got kind of a kind of a catch twenty two here. If somebody calls my office phone, I want it to ring my cell phone. Now, follow me carefully on this. If somebody calls my office phone, I want it to ring my cell phone. In order to do that, it has to dial a nine to get an outside line. Then it calls my cell phone number. When my cell phone calls in to the gateway, it does not have that nine as part of its caller ID. So how in the world am I recognized as me? Because the number that's called to reach me has a nine. My caller ID does not have a nine. How does it know it's me? By default, it doesn't. By default, your caller ID has to be a complete match. I never leave it like this. I always say it's a partial match. And if you're in an area where you're only using seven digit dialing to call a local number, this will not work because it says, all right, we'll do a partial match and we'll match the 10 rightmost digits. That's not enough. That's not enough. Or that's too many, I should say. We're going to set that to a seven. We're going to set that to seven. All right. That, I'm just thinking if there are any, no, these are the settings that I typically set up when I'm setting up my service parameters. I'm going to do a save. Let's do a save on that. And now we're, we're starting, uh, now we've kind of laid some of the, the basic groundwork. Now what we want to do is to, is to prepare to add our IP phones. Now, I'm not just going to go in right now and say device, phone, add. That would be very inefficient because there are so many there are so many parameters the phone has to have. It has to know what time zone it's in. It might have to have an NTP network time protocol reference. There's so much stuff that it has to have. What we're going to do is lay the groundwork first, and then we'll add the phone. The first thing I want to do has to do with network time protocol. Now, when you install your server, I'm going to go over to my Cisco OS administration. When you first install a server, it makes you add, or it asks you to add anyway, a network time protocol server. And I've already done that. If you want to adjust that, here's where you adjust it. You go into the, to the OS administration screen. And you're going to go under settings, NTP server, and you see that I've got one right here. And now, right now, it says it's not accessible for some reason. Maybe it's not. Uh, I might not have that booted up correctly at the moment. But um, you could add a new one if you want to. But here's where you could adjust that. Now, let's go back to our administration screen. And let's start doing the configuration required for the phone. The first thing we want to do. Now, remember, I'm not just going to add the phone right now. I'm going to add a bunch of other stuff that we will assign to the phone very efficiently later on. But let me get back, log back into my administration screen. I'll go ahead and tell you, well, if I could type in the password correctly, that would be helpful. Oh, I hit caps lock. I'm going to go under system and I'm not going to do this right now, but do you see this option of device pool? This is super, super powerful. What a device pool does is allow us to take a collection of settings 
like the NTP settings, location, region, communications manager, just a lot of settings, and we can apply them to the phone all at once. So what I want to do is I want to set this stuff up beforehand. And then when I add the phone, I'm going to say, yes, and assign it this device pool. And when I say assign it this device pool, bam, it just inherits all those settings. So let's set that up first. Now, there's a bunch of stuff that goes into the device pool. Let's set that up now. The first thing we're going to set up is this Cisco Unified Communications Manager group. Remember we talked about redundancy with our clusters earlier? Yeah, what we can do is define a grouping of communication manager clusters that's given out to an IP phone when it boots up. We've got one by default that's called default. Now, in our scenario today, I'm going to pretend that we have two sites. We have an HQ site. We've got a BR1 site. And I'm just going to rename this one to HQ. And notice that by default, the only communications manager that's going to be used is the publisher. Well, Cisco says you shouldn't use the publisher as your primary server to register phones. It's, it's busy enough doing other things. So what we want to do is I'm going to select my subscriber up here, click the little down arrow to move it down, and I'm going to adjust the order. I can hit the button over here on the right to adjust the order a little bit. And now the subscriber is listed first. That's a best practice recommendation from Cisco. Now, I don't have a third one here, but if I did, I could, I could have a maximum of three communication manager servers in this group. Now, this group, in a moment, we're going to assign that to the device pool, and we're going to assign the device pool to the phone. But for now, let's save this group. That's our new group. And I could create one for another site, but really it's, I'm pretending that BR1 phones, they're registering over the IP WAN with this site, so really no need to do that. The next thing we, that we want to set up in preparation for our device pool is this phone NTP reference. Now, we've already got an NTP reference set up for the server itself, but that's not enough. We need to have an NTP reference for, get this point, major point here, SIP speaking phones. I don't have one by default. I'm going to add a new NTP reference. I'm going to say that I've got an NTP server at this IP address, and I do. And I'm going to use Unicast. I'm going to speak directly to this IP address. I'm going to add this as my NTP reference. Now, here's the big point. SIP phones need this information to get their time. Skinny speaking phones do not. Skinny speaking phones will just take the server's time. The server says, here's my time. You can have it. No, the SIP phones want to speak to the NTP server, and here's how we say, here is the IP address of that NTP server. So you don't need to do this if you don't have SIP speaking phones, but I'm guessing we're going to have more and more SIP speaking phones as time goes on. Now, we might have different time zones, different areas of the network that we're trying to support. So I also want to go in and set up a date time group. And I've got one by default. It's called CM Local. I'm going to change that to HQ. I'm going to pretend, in our example today, I'm going to pretend that HQ is in, uh, it's in California. So we're going to be GMT minus eight. I'll say we, we're somewhere around Los Angeles. There we go. We're going to be around Los Angeles. We can, uh, by the way, when the uh, date and time appear on the phone, the, uh, the date can be, uh, the month, day, and year can be separated with slashes or a, a dot or a dash. I'm going to use a slash. Also, different countries in the world, they're going to use, they might say month, day, year, day, month, year, year, month, day. So you, you can adjust how that looks. You can also use 24-hour time, or you can use uh, AM and PM for 12-hour, whatever you prefer. Now, remember the NTP reference we added? Here's where we link that to the date time group. I'm going to select that NTP reference we just added. Say I want to add that one. And I'll save this. Now, this is for my HQ site. Let's pretend that I've got a branch office site. I'll call it BR1. I'm going to make a copy of this one. And I'm going to say for the BR1 site, I'll pretend it's in my home state of Kentucky. And we are the GMT minus five. Actually, minus four when we're doing daylight savings time. But I'm going to say it's near Louisville. And I will save that. So check this out. I now have two different date time groups for different, different time zones. I can apply those to different device pools in a few moments and assign those to my different phones. Now that we've set up the date time group, the next thing let's do, we can now set up regions. 
I'm going to go under System and say Region, Information, and select Region. Now, here's what a region does. With, well, think about within the HQ site. We've got, let's say, gigabit links. We're not overly concerned with the trivial amount of bandwidth that a phone call is going to take up on a gig network. I mean, a phone call, even with overhead, even if we're not doing compression, it might take up 80K of bandwidth. Not really going to make a dent in our gig connection. But over the IPWAN, it might. If we've got multiple simultaneous phone calls going over a relatively low-speed WAN, yeah, yeah, we might want to limit that bandwidth. So what a region does, a region influences how much bandwidth can be used between different regions of the network. Now, right now, I've got a default region. I'm going to say that's my HQ region. I'll rename that, and I'll just do a, do a save. And I'm going to say within the HQ region, when I'm talking from HQ to HQ, I'm going to have a maximum audio codec bit rate of 64K. That's going to allow me to use an uncompressed codec like G711. And I'll save that. So HQ to HQ, I'm going to be able to speak up to 64K, payload only, and that would include G711, G722. Now, let's add another region. Let's add one for the BR1 site that we were talking about. I'm going to add my BR1 region, and I'm going to say from BR1 to BR1, yeah, no worries within the site. Yeah, we, we can use uh, 64K if we want to. Let's save that. But if I'm talking over the IP WAN, if I'm going from BR1 to HQ, let's be a bit more conservative with our bandwidth. Maybe I want to use ILBC, the Internet Low Bit Rate Codec. So I can set that to 16K. Set that to 16K, and I'll do a save. Now, by the way, just because I said 16K, that is not forcing the code. Big point here. This is not forcing the codec to be ILBC. It says, whatever you negotiate, it should not be more than 16K. I could negotiate G.729 if I wanted to. But if I, uh, at a maximum, I can negotiate a codec that takes up 16K of bandwidth. By the way, I set this from BR1 to HQ. No need to go back and, and say HQ to BR1. It, it applies a reciprocal configuration. It's going to do the same thing in the other direction. So let me save that. And now we've got a couple of regions that we can assign to our device pool. Something that kind of goes hand in hand with, uh, with regions is the concept of locations. Remember I was saying earlier that if I'm trying to call over the IP WAN and there's just simply not enough bandwidth available, I might be denied. I might be told, nope, sorry, you cannot place a call because there's not enough bandwidth available. What determines that? One way of determining that is to use locations. So let's go under system and uh, let's go under location info, location, and I've got a location for the, the HQ site. It's called Hub None. The reason it's called Hub is traditional locations assume that everybody was connected in a hub and spoke topology. The, the headquarters was the hub, all of the different spoke sites, they came in remotely. So I'm going to rename this to HQ. This is going to be my HQ site. I'll say save. Let me add another site. I'm going to add the BR1 location, and I'll save that. And now what I can do is set up bandwidth limits between these sites. I can say from BR1 to HQ, and when I do this, it's going to be applied in the other direction as well. I'm going to say the maximum amount of audio bandwidth that I could have is 80K. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting point that's not obvious at all. When I was giving region bandwidth amounts, it was for the payload only bandwidth amount for my codec. So G.711, 64K. When I'm setting up locations, it includes layer three and layer four overhead, but not layer two overhead. So it's a bigger number per call. It's going to be 80K for G.711. It's going to be 24K for G.729. And I'll do a save. And again, this is reciprocal. If I were to go look at this on HQ, it would now know that it had an 80K bandwidth limit going back to BR1. That's our location configuration. We're cruising along here. Now, something else that causes a lot of confusion 
is the concept of partitions and calling search spaces. Now, partitions and calling search spaces, they can limit who can call whom. We can say, I don't want this phone calling a long distance, or I don't want this call, phone calling internationally. So what can we do? We can set up restrictions. Now, there are different schools of thought about how calling search spaces and partitions need to be set up, but just to get it going so I can have a base set of partitions and calling search spaces, here's how I like to start out. Now, depending on my particular implementation, depending on how I'm doing things, I'm not going to leave it like this, but just to get it going, just so my phones can initially place some phone calls, here's what I do to begin with. I'm going to go into call routing, class of control partition, and let me define a partition for you. A partition is a collection of dialable destinations, phone numbers, directory numbers on our phones. Those are dialable destinations. Dial patterns that get me out to an international number or a long distance or a local number. Those are dialable destinations. Voicemail numbers, those are dial pretty much anything you can dial, we assign it to a partition. And here's what I'm going to do. All the numbers inside of my company, all the numbers that I'm assigning to my phones, I'm going to assign them to a partition that I call internal because they're internal to the company. I'm going to create an HQ partition, which is going to be used for route plans. We're not going to get into route plans today, but it could be used for route plans to go out of my HQ gateway to get out to the rest of the world. I would have another partition called BR1 that will be assigned to dial plans that got me out of the BR1 gateway. So I'm going to create three partitions. One for internal. Oh, let me make a, a big disclaimer here as we're talking about this. You need to be super, super careful and make sure you don't inadvertently restrict emergency calls. Like in the U.S., we use a 911 for emergency services. You don't want to set this up in such a way that you're blocking emergency services. So be very aware of that. Make sure you're giving permissions to, to, call, uh, to call emergency services. Sometimes I don't put any restrictions whatsoever on, uh, on my emergency, uh, my E911 setup. But here, I'm just showing you just in theory how we're going to set up these three different partitions, assuming you're going to make sure that E11, uh, that 911 calls get out in your environment. I'm going to say internal, and then I'm going to say I'm going to have a partition for HQ. I'm going to have a partition for BR1, and I'm going to save that. Now that I've got my partitions created, I'm going to create a couple of calling search spaces. What is a calling search space? It's a collection of partitions. Now, I can assign a calling search space to a phone or, or a directory number on a phone, and it gives that phone or that directory number permission to call a destination. For example, I'm going to assign the HQ calling search space to my HQ phones. Who can they call? Well, I want them to be able to call numbers inside the company. I want them to be able to call internal numbers, so I add them to the, uh, I assign it to the internal partition or assign them the internal partition. I also want them to reach out to the PST and using my HQ gateway. So I'm going to also give it the HQ partition. So the HQ calling search space that I'm going to assign to my phone, it contains the internal and the HQ partitions. Let's save that. Let's make a copy. Let's do one for BR1. I don't want it to use the HQ partition, but I do want it to use internal, but instead I want it to use BR1. That looks great. Let's do a save. I now have a couple of calling search spaces. Fantastic. The next thing we want to do, we're, we're getting close to adding phones. The next thing I want to do, though, is dealing with my media resources. Now, media resources let you do things like set up conference calls, do transcoding when we're trying to convert between different codec types. It allows you to have media termination points. And it allows you to do music on hold. It lets you to have, uh, let you have uh, announcements called the enunciator service. But those are extra configurations oftentimes. I just want to have sort of a placeholder where I can go add a music on hold service or where I can add a conferencing service. And to create those placeholders, we first create an MRG, a media resource group. We do a find. We don't have any by default. I'm going to create one for both sides. I'm going to say I've got an HQ media resource group, and I'm going to assign it all of these media resources that 
that we get just by virtue of the fact that we've got these servers installed. So I'm going to select all of these different services, all these different resources, and add them. That's for HQ. I'll say save. I'll make a copy. And I'll say that, yep, BR1 phones, they have access to all those resources as well. With the understanding that probably you're going to come back and modify this depending on your particular design. But I just wanted to have these in place. I wanted to be able to assign these to my to my device pool to have sort of a sort of a placeholder. Now that we've got that created, I think, let me just uh, think through this, make sure I'm not forgetting anything, but I think we're ready to create a device pool now. Now I'm just going to do HQ phones today. BR1 would be the same thing, but I'm going to go in for the device pool and we've got one by default. It's called default. I'm going to rename this to HQ. And the HQ device pool is going to contain all these settings. Remember earlier we set up the HQ communications manager group? Yeah, that's part of it. We also set up the date time group, the region. Let me assign the HQ. Oh, forgot something with my media resources. My bad. Let me go back to my media resource list for a second. Yeah, I forgot that. In addition to creating the media resource groups, we need to put those inside of a media resource group list. So I'm going to have an HQ media resource group list that contains, you guessed it, the HQ media resource group. Let's do a save. Let's make a copy. I'll have a BR1 media resource group list, and it's going to contain the BR1 media resource group, and we'll save that. All right, now back to our device pool. Our HQ, dev our HQ device pool has the HQ Unified Communications Manager group, the date time group, the region. Let's give it the HQ location. And you see there's lots of other things we could do later on, but, but those are the basic things I want to set up. I'll say save. I'll do a reset just for good measure. Let's now add one for the BR1 site. For the BR1, I'll say the device pool is BR1. It's going to belong to the, I, I don't really care about the Communications Manager group. It doesn't have to be site specific. We're going to use the same servers. In this case, the date time group though is going to be BR1. The region is going to be BR1. The media resource group list is going to be BR1. And oh, I forgot to do the location, didn't I? Yeah, let's do the location. Did I do the location for HQ? Let's see. No, I didn't. Let's add that. Now we're all set. Now we've got these two device pools, which are these massive collections of parameters. So now when I add a phone, I don't have to say, use this region, use this location, use this date time group. No, I just say use this device pool and it inherits all this stuff. Awesome. Now there's one more thing we have to do before we add a phone. Now we don't have to do it, but I like to, it's a good practice. And that's to add a user associated with each phone. So I'm going to add, a, uh, I'm going to add a couple of users. I'm going to add one for, I've got a 9971 phone and, uh, that's HQ phone one, and I've got HQ phone two as well. Let's go under user management and user, and I want to add a user. Now, this user ID, I'm going to say is, I'll just say it's HQ phone one. And I'll give it a password of Cisco, not recommended for the real world, but helps me to remember it. The pin, again, not recommended for the real world, but easy to remember for a lab environment. I'll just do one, two, three, four, five. The last name is going to be phone one. The first name is going to be HQ. By the way, these names, if you're using this with Cisco Unity Connection as your messaging solution, it does an amazing job of pronouncing these names. It's really, really impressive the way it can pronounce those names. Now, I'm going to save this, and you have to save it before you're able to go down and assign some permissions to these users. Remember I said earlier that I wanted a user to be able to go out and uh, I wanted them to be able to go out and manage some of their own settings. Yeah, to do that, I'm going to say, I want to give them some permissions. I want to add them to some access groups. I'm going to add them to the standard CCM end users access group and standard CTI enable. Those are the best practice recommendation. Those are the two that I normally start with. That's going to allow them to get to their user web pages and do some basic things. I'm going to add those and I'll say save. Once I save them, if I scroll down, notice that those uh, these users or this user now has all these different roles. It's got all these permissions that it didn't have before. That's pretty awesome. 
let's add another one. Let's add a user for HQ Phone 2. HQ Phone 2, password Cisco. I'll say the pin is 12345, 12345. Last name is Phone 2. First name is HQ. I'll say save. Let's add them to those two access control groups of standard CCM end users. Standard CTI enabled. Let's add selected. And I'll do a save. We've now got our users added, and at long last, we're finally ready to add our IP phones. Let's add these two IP phones and see if they'll call one another. I'm going to go under device and phone, and I'm going to add a new phone. Now, the first phone I want to add, I've got a Cisco 9971, which only speaks SIP, by the way. It only speaks SIP. I'm going to say Cisco 9971 and next. And notice that it, it did not give me an option for the protocol. It's got to be SIP. Now, the uh, the MAC address, I've got to know the MAC address for this phone. Now, I could just take uh, something like a post-it note and try to scribble it down off the back of the phone. Here's what I prefer to do instead. A little uh, real-world tip for you. I'm going to go over to the switch to which this phone is connected and just copy-paste it from there. I'm, uh, the, I've got my phones connected to switch SW1. And I'm going to say show CDP neighbor detail, and I'm going to find my phones. Here's my 9971 phone, and here's its MAC address. Now, when you're copying the MAC address, be careful. Don't copy the SEP. That's not part of the MAC address. SEP stands for Celsius Ethernet phone. Cisco got it in the business of, um, of IP telephony. Back in the mid-90s, they acquired a company called Celsius that was spelled with an S. SEP stands for Celsius Ethernet Phone, kind of a holdover from the mid-90s. But I'm going to copy, don't copy the SEP, but I'm going to copy the MAC address, and I'm going to paste it in here as the MAC address for that phone. The description is going to be HQ Phone 1. The device pool is going to be what we just created, HQ. The calling search space is going to be HQ. And let's see, for a SIP speaking phone, there's a few things we have to do. We've got to do some SIP specific stuff. Let's see, I need to add a device security profile. I'm just looking for that. Anything with a star next to it means that it's a required field. I'm just scroll. Here's the device security profile. I'll say it's non-secure. I need to add a SIP profile. I'll just take the standard SIP profile. Oh, and because this is a video enabled phone, I want to show you how to set up a phone to do video. It's got a camera built in, but it's disabled by default. I want to enable that camera. Video capabilities, disabled by default. I want to enable the video capabilities. So I'll say enabled, and we'll do a save. We've now, oh, it said, uh, what did it say was required? Oh, I forgot to say, uh, you know, we went to all the trouble to create the user. I forgot to create the, uh, to say who the user was. My apologies. Let me scroll up here, and I'll assign the user. The owner user ID is HQ Phone One. There we go. Oh, and I've got to do a phone button template. I'll just use the standard phone button template. Now we're all set. Now that we've done that, we still don't have a phone number, do we? Let's add a phone number or a directory number to this phone. I'm going to say add a new DN, add a new directory number. And the directory number I'm going to say is 2001. And remember I said that we would assign dialable destinations to a partition? Well, I'm going to assign this dialable destination to internal. I'm going to give this a description of HQ Phone 1. The alerting name is, I'm going to say is HQ Phone 1. And if we scroll in just a bit, you're going to see my call forward settings. What happens if somebody calls this phone and we're busy? Or what happens if we call this phone and we don't answer? Well, I might want to go to voicemail. I'm going to say if we don't, if we're busy, then I'll say go to voicemail. If we don't answer, go to voicemail. Now, a couple of questions. What constitutes a busy condition and what constitutes a no answer condition? Well, here we can say what the ring no answer duration is. I'm going to say that it is 10 seconds. So if I don't answer after 10 seconds, we're going to assume that I'm not going to answer and the call is going to go off to voicemail once we have that defined. What constitutes a busy condition? 
Well, by default, it's a lot like having a message waiting in your home. Uh, message waiting in your home has, uh, uh, you're, you're on the line and you hear sort of like a beep beep to tell you that somebody else is calling you. And you say, oh, I've got somebody else on the other line. Can you hold on a moment? And we switch over to the other line and we talk to them. That's what happens by default here. I, I, I prefer not to do that. I prefer that if I'm on the phone, I want the call to go on to voicemail. So I want to be considered busy if I'm on a single call. And that's where we set, and here's where we set that up. It's the busy trigger. I'm going to set the busy trigger to a one. I'm going to set the busy trigger to a one. Meaning that if I'm on, if I'm on one call, we go off to voicemail. Something else I like to set up, the caller ID, I'm going to say this is HQ phone one. And the external phone number mask, this is a big discussion that we get into in my uh, in my courses that we were talking about. I like to start off with what's called the full E.164 formatted number. An E.164 number is a global number. Theoretically, you could dial this number from from Alabama, or you could dial it from Saskatchewan, and you're going to get this. You're going to be able to reach this person because it's a globally dialable destination. It's a globally dialable destination. And uh, an E.164 number begins with the plus. The plus says this is an E.164 number. And the number or numbers after that is the country code. The country code for North America is a one. And uh, then I'm going to say what the phone number is. It's area code 408 2001 is going to be my phone number. Let's save that. We'll go back to my phone. And I'm going to do a... Let's do a save and I'm going to do a reset. Now the phone's not going to register just yet because we haven't assigned it an IP address, but let's do a reset and let's go add another phone. We've got one phone now. Notice the status is, is not registered yet. Let's now add our second phone and we'll see if we can call one another. I'm going to now add a 79, a 7965 phone. This can speak either SIP or skinny. Just to be different, I'll say skinny this time. And we need to know the MAC address. So let's go back and find the MAC address here. Here's my 7965. Here's the MAC address. I'm going to copy it, being careful not to copy the SEP. I'm going to paste in the MAC address. I'm going to say the description is HQ phone 2 device pool is HQ. Oh, HQ. The phone button template is going to be a standard 7965 skinny speaking phone. The soft key template is going to be just a standard user. The calling search space is going to be for HQ. The owner is going to be BR, or excuse me, it's going to be HQ phone 2. We don't have as many things to set up here because it's not SIP and it doesn't have video capabilities. I do need to set it to a, uh, a non-secure device security profile. We'll save it. And I'm just going to go through this quicker because we, we've already done it once. I'm going to give this a directory number. 2002 is the directory number. It's also going to belong to the internal partition. The description is going to be HQ phone 2. So is the alerting name. For call forward, I'm going to say if we're busy or if we don't answer, I want to go to voicemail. 10 seconds constitutes a no answer condition. One call active right now constitutes a busy condition. My caller ID is going to be HQ phone 2. And I'm going to use the E.164 formatted number. And we're done. Now, in order for these phones to start working, I need to give, I need, they need to boot up and register with, uh, with an IP address. So let's now set this server up as a DHCP server. Let me show you how to do that. And hopefully these phones will register for us. What we're going to do is go under system DHCP and I'm going to set up a DHCP server. Now, right now, I've got the DHCP server tur service turned off, but I'm going to make my publisher my DHCP server. And I'm going to say what, what the, oh, well, actually, I'm not using DNS here, so I'm not going to worry about, I'm not going to worry about DNS. But uh, I do want to say, what is my TFTP server? You see, when a uh, when a phone boots up, when a phone boots up, it goes out 
and gets its IP address from a DHCP server, but that DHCP server also tells it it's um, it tells it uh, the IP address of a TFTP server. It's from that TFTP server where the phone downloads its configuration file that contains that communications manager group that we set up earlier with with those three servers. So it goes and tries to register with one of those servers. So I'm going to say my TFTP server is 192.168.1.71 as a backup, 192.168.1.72, great. Now, I'm setting this up at the server level. I'm not setting up subnets yet. This is going to be inherited by any of my subnets. So let's save this. Now let's create a subnet. Let's go under DHCP subnet this time, and let's add one for HQ. Now my subnet for HQ, let's add a new one. It's going to have an address. It's going to be in the subnet of 10.10.120.0. Now, I think this is very confusing. Confusing. Make sure you catch this. Normally, when we specify a subnet address, don't we specify a subnet mask to go with it? Sure we do. Where's the mask? It's way down here. I don't know why it's so far down, but it's way down here. And I'm going to specify a 24-bit subnet mask, 255.255.255.0. I'm going to say what range of IP addresses I wish to hand out. I'm going to hand out 10.10.120.10 all the way through 10.10.120.20. I'm also going to specify, <coughs> specify my default gateway. It's 10.10.120.1, and I'm done. Now I've Oh, uh, let's see. I didn't select which DHCP server we're using. There we go. Now, the only thing left... Before these phones can register, I need to enable that DHCP service. So let's go back to our serviceability screen and turn it on. Remember, we did not activate it earlier. Let's go back to our serviceability screen. Or maybe I'm already, let's see. I might be able to do it from this other tab. Yeah, here we are on the on the publisher. Notice the DHCP server is turned off. I'm going to check that box and say, turn it on. Might take a few seconds, but after it does, I might need to reboot the phones to make them go out and get their IP address. But we'll uh, we'll check as soon as this service activates. We'll go out and check and see how we're doing. Okay, that was successful. Let's go back to our administration screen now. And are the phones registered or do I need to reboot them? Ah, beautiful. Music to my eyes. These phones are both registered. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go, I hope, I hope the microphone is going to pick it up. I'm going to go over here to where my phones are, and I'm going to try to call from one phone to the other, and let's see if it works. I'll be right back. Well, I hope you were able to hear that uh, that phone ring in the background. That is what we wanted to accomplish today, folks. We wanted to we wanted to be able to take a a setup from really from scratch and set that uh, and set that up. So I hope you enjoyed that. Something I did want to want to share with you. I, I did promise you a little bonus at the end. Uh, I want to talk a, a little bit about why. A little bit about what. Let's see. I need to let me share this out with you so you guys can see this. Let's talk a little bit about why people have a challenge. Why do people fail when it comes to their collaboration certification? One reason that they that they fail when it comes to their collaboration certification is that maybe they go take a class from a uh, Cisco learning partner, which which I which I encourage you to do. I, I worked for a Cisco learning partner for nearly fourteen years. It's awesome. Or they go read some Cisco Press books. I'm a big fan of that too. I've written a lot of Cisco Press books, but they they go through that training process, but then they find themselves without without a lab. Well, the, they don't have equipment to do hands-on training, and you can certainly buy your own home lab. I built one to develop the training, 
that, uh, that I'm going to be talking about. But when I developed that training or when I developed that home lab, it was not cheap. It cost about $10,000. Now the prices vary depending on your Cisco discounts, but I paid about $10,000 to set up a collaboration home lab. And assuming you even did that, assuming you've got a home lab, you still might find yourself with no lab scenarios to work through. You don't have documentation of, of lab exercises to go through. And that's where I want, want to really, really help you out today because I've got a solution for you. And here, here's that solution. You can just look over my shoulder as I walk you through a ton of lab demos. That's what you're going to be getting with my CCNA collaboration video training series, as well as my CCMP collaboration video training series. And I've taught collaboration courses or previously voice courses since 2001. And something I've noticed is there's a lot of overlap between the NA curriculum and the NP curriculum, uh, and even the IE curriculum. Basically, you're stud studying the same basic concepts. You're studying communications manager. You're studying a Cisco Unity connection. You're studying the Cisco Unity Express. You're studying the Cisco IAM and Present Server. So I strongly believe that there is a huge benefit. There is a huge benefit in getting both of these products, and I believe that so strongly that here's what I want to do for you today. I've got, uh, I've been selling just for a few weeks. It's a, it's a brand new program. I've been selling my CCNA collaboration video training series for $197. It, the runtime is a little over seven hours. I've been selling my CCNP video uh, or collaboration video series for $197. That's about seven hours of training as well. But what I would suggest that we do is get both of these together today, and I'm going to give you a massive discount. In fact, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to throw in some other stuff. I've got a CCMP voice video series. You see, prior to collaboration, it was the voice track. And what I did, I, I had some videos for that. I went through and I hand-selected videos from that CCMP voice track that apply to collaboration. So you get about 28 videos seeing me set up different features that completely apply to your collaboration studies. And one of the most challenging topics in collaboration I found is quality of service. People get really challenged with quality of service. So I'm also throwing in to this combo pack, 12 quality of service videos. Now, if you add all that up, we're talking about a value of $558. And I, I, I so strongly believe that people should get all of these together instead of just, uh, just one. I've given a massive combo discount. I've given a, a discount of, uh, of, of, over, uh, of $264. And I've been selling for a few weeks now this combo pack for $294. Compare that to trying to, to, to spending $10,000 to get your own, uh, own home lab. You can just look over my shoulder instead. But I want to do you an extra favor. I want to do you a solid for joining me today in this webinar and also for putting up with the uh, the uh, 20 minutes or so of technical issues that we had at the very beginning. I want to give you a price today of $50 off that. You can get a $50 discount. Here's how you do it. I want you to get a webcast price of $244 for all of this. And you can just use the code webcast when you check out. I'm just going to use the code webcast. In fact, let me go ahead and one second, and I want to make that available to you where you can click on that right now. One second. So here is the combo pack discount that you see. Uh, you, you should see that displayed on your screen right now. You can just click on that buy now button. Remember to enter the uh, the code webcast to get your fifty dollar discount. Also, if um, if you're going after your CCIE in collaboration, I've also got a fifteen hour plus CCIE walkthrough video series, and I'd be glad to give you the. Uh, I'd be glad to give you a $50 discount on what I call my ultimate collaboration pack. It includes the CCIE videos in addition to everything we just talked about. Uh, I think it's it's normally $491. You can take $50 off of that as well. 
So I'll give you just, a, I'll give you about 10 more seconds to click on buy now on this one. And then I'm going to put up the one for the CCIE. Or you can just go to my website. You can go out to, uh, you can go out to kwtrain.com, click on uh, the products link. So we'll go to kwtrain.com slash products and you can see them there. But I'm going to remove this offer from the screen now and show you the one for, and show you the one for the CCIE bundle. I call it the ultimate collaboration bundle. If you want to check that one out, use the code webcast and get $50. You get, <laughs> you get pretty much every collaboration video I have in that case. Uh, and if you want me to put the uh, the other one back up, I'll, I'll do that in a few seconds as well. But I promised to give some Q&A time at the end of today. So I'm going to be looking right now at the Q&A slides. Let's see, we've got a bunch of stuff that happened throughout. I'm going to so if you've typed in a question before, it got buried in, in the flood of other things that uh, that came in. So do me a favor, go ahead and chat in your questions right now, and we'll take some time and answer the questions. We'll stay a little bit late. I didn't intend to stay past the 90 minute mark, but obviously we had some, we had about 20 minutes of, of technical issues. So we'll certainly do that. See, somebody says these links aren't working. Let me try it out here. Yeah, if you if you click on the buy now uh, or, or just go to kwtrain.com slash uh, slash products, and there you can get the ultimate collaboration bundle that includes CCIE or the uh, the collaboration combo pack. Enter the enter the discount code of webinar and you get fifty dollars off. And I'll be happy to to give some shout outs to the first couple of customers that come through here. Just refresh the screen so I can see when those come in. And uh, looking for your questions right now. Yeah, I just saw the first one come in. And it is from trying to refresh my screen to get a name. First customer of the day is uh, Richard Tuttle. Richard, thanks so much for your purchase. I know uh, Richard and I. We've been uh, we've been emailing back and forth a little bit lately. Uh, Richard just picked up the collaboration combo pack. Thanks a ton for that, Richard. In fact, I'll go ahead and put that that offer back up on screen. Looking for your questions. Anybody uh, with any questions about anything we discussed today? Anything communications manager related? Now's a great time. I'll put that collaboration combo offer up. Let's see. Any other questions coming in? Not seeing anybody asking any questions at this point. I'll, I'll look back and see if I can pick up some other questions. Oh, here we go. I was looking at the wrong screen. My apologies. Yeah, here's a question from Elson. Elson saying, when talking about protocols, you mentioned MGCP, H.323, and SIP. To be, uh, uh, those could be used. Would skinny also be used here, or is that just for communication between the server and the endpoint device? Elson, that is a fantastic question. 99% of the time, you're not going to be using skinny between your communications manager server and your gateway. And I say 99% of the time because there are some older access servers out there that Cisco used to have, and you could actually speak skinny between them. They give you connections out to analog devices like phones, fax machines, things like that. So there are some devices that would do that. But my guess is none of us are ever going to run into those. So it's almost always going to be MGCP, SIP, or H.323. Fantastic question. Joseph saying, why do you recommend getting rid of DNS? Well, there, there are pros and cons. The, the con is if you want to change the IP address of your communications manager server and move it somewhere else, you could just update the DNS table. And suddenly you're pointing to that new IP address. I doubt that you would ever do that because if you do that, it completely messes up your licensing. Your licensing is based not just on the MAC address of your server. It's also based on the IP address. It's based on your destination gateway. It's run through some big hash. So your licensing is going to have to be messed with if you do that. 
the reason I like to remove DNS and the reason Cisco recommends that we remove DNS Reliance is it's another potential point of failure and it slows down your call setup because we've got to go out and make that extra step of resolving the IP address of our communications manager server. That is a fantastic question. A question from Armin saying, when do you think about, uh, what do you think about using uh, INE's CCIA collaboration rack rentals for uh, studying for the NA test? Okay, so there are a lot of rack rental companies out there that, uh, that have collaboration racks. And uh, the question is, can you use those for your CCNA collaboration studies? Largely, yes, you can. Absolutely. Now, per, just personally, I have not used the uh, the I and E rack. Um, a lot of times, people ask me for rack rental recommendations. I'll, I'll give you my recommendation, and that is collabcert.com. Collabcert.com. It's one word. It's written. Uh, it's run by a good friend of mine. Uh, um, that's uh, actually he. He was my, one of my. Uh, he, he was one of my uh, one of my trainers, but go out to collabcert.com and uh, it's uh, Vic Marley that runs it. But use the code KW Collab. Use the code KW Collab, and you'll get ten percent off your rack rentals. Uh, he's he's also got some great workbooks out there. He does boot camps. So um, so collabcert.com. Use the discount code KW Collab, and you'll get ten percent off. Great. Awesome question. We've got more questions. Mario saying, how much value do you see in the CCNA collaboration certification? That greatly depends. Uh, it depends on where you live. Are you willing to move? Are you going to be Are you going to be consulting with somebody? There's certainly demand out there for collaboration, uh, people with collaboration certifications. And I recommend you don't stop at the CCNA level. Obviously, that's a nice almost necessary first step. But here's what I recommend. Get on a job search board. Uh, like here in the US, I would use dice.com, indeed.com, monster.com. And I would just type in CCNA collaboration, CCNP collaboration, CCIE collaboration. And I'd see what comes up, see what the job demand is before you start down any track. Personally, though, a lot of times people say, all right, I've got my I've done my route switch. What should I do next? Should I go security? Should I go, should I go collaboration? And my answer is always the same. What do you enjoy the most? You're going to be spending a lot of your time working with this technology. Do what you enjoy the most. Let me give you a couple more shout outs. I said I would give shout outs to, uh, to some of the customers as they, as they're coming in here, I'll give a, give another one real quick. And wow, might, might have some trouble pronouncing the name. T A F A D Z W A. So sorry, I'm not able to pronounce your uh, pronounce your name correctly. But uh, yeah, you all. It looks like uh, yeah, you just picked up. You just picked up the CC uh, or the uh, collaboration combo pack as well. My thanks for doing that. I'll give another shout out. Somebody oh somebody picked up the CCIE or, or picked out the ultimate collaboration combo pack. And that was Donald Rob. Donald Rob, thank you so much for that. I'm sure you will love those videos. Let's take some more questions. Now, Kevin said, uh, no, uh, Jeff says, Kevin, is there any specific config needed on the switch specifically for SIP, uh, such as uh, uh, QoS or anything else? Great question. Quality of service on a Cisco Catalyst 3750 series switch. Oh, Rich, uh, uh, Rich Tuttle, I just saw that uh, you said that you missed getting the $50 discount. No worries. I'm going to wait through all this after the webinar today. I'll send you a $50 discount. I, I noticed that you forgot to type in the, uh, the discount code. No problem. I'll get you that by the end of the day, Richard. Thanks so much. But the question is, do we need to do anything on the switch regarding to SIP? Not necessarily. Now, in the CCIA lab, you might be asked to do something like treat SIP a certain way or treat MGCP a certain way. There are certainly best practice recommendations for what we do on the switch. In fact, let me give you a free video you can go watch. Go to my YouTube channel. Again, just search for Kevin Wallace and find my YouTube channel. My, my most popular video ever was the uh, Catalyst 3750, um, the Catalyst 3750 Quality of Service. 
uh, video. It runs about an hour and 45 minutes long, but it covers everything you want to know uh, and, and more about quality of service on this switch. It gets really, really detailed, shaped around Robin, switched around Robin, policing, marking, you name it, it's in there. Uh, it's it's for the CCIA level person, but feel free to watch it. All right, let's see, uh, see if we have any other questions. Yeah, one of the, uh, we've got another uh, question saying, hey, when does this offer expire? You know what? I was thinking about expiring it, uh, uh, expiring it, you know, just, just shortly after the webinar, like 30 minutes or something. But I, I realized that some people might not have got on because we had to switch webinars. So I don't want them to miss out. I, I, I'll leave it open to midnight at least, okay? At least to midnight tonight, that, uh, that code will be valid. I want to make sure that anybody else has that option and I'll try to get them the, the, the replay by the end of the day. So a uh, great question. Another question. I'm working with Communications Manager version 8.6, and we're currently working on a project to upgrade to the latest version of Communication Manager. However, we still have a ton of old hardware. <laughs> They've got ATA 18060s. For those of you that don't know, that's old hardware. That's really old hardware. Uh, my question is, are you aware of any other hardware, any other hardware that will be expiring soon? Oh, it seems like with every version, something expires. I would, I, I don't want to trust my own recollection. I might miss something. I'll give you one example. Uh, I know that, I know that if you're going from like version seven to version eight, suddenly the, uh, if you have a Unity module or Unity Express module inside your router, that's not going to work. Uh, so yeah, there are some things that, that typically, get retired at the end of every cycle. So yeah, just check Cisco's uh, website for, for up-to-date compatibility worksheets. Let's see, Christian's saying, are you planning uh, for an offer regarding uh, guys who have already bought some of your courses? Yeah, you know, that's just, that's just one of those things that, uh, you know, from time to time, you go buy something from Apple and they run maybe a, a $20 off discount on uh, on Black Friday or something. That's just that's just one of those things, an opportunity cost. If you've if you've had my course for two months, I hope you got great value out of that. And, and I hope uh, hope that's not going to upset you that that I will occasionally maybe offer a little value, like an extra $50 bonus here or there for um, for people that attend these these special things like like the webinar. That's just kind of the way. I mean, if I if I go to a, if I go to uh, to Walmart and they run a sale next week, I'll like oh, oh well at least I got a week's worth of use out of it. That's kind of my viewpoint on that. Um, let's see. I'm looking for any other questions. Uh. Johannes is saying, "Are the uh, in the uh, in the collab combo pack? Are all of those in reference to the new uh, to the new certifications? Yes, they are all in reference to the new certifications. In fact, remember that uh, I did pull a few videos from from the prior certification that are still applicable, just so you can have some more examples. But yeah, th these are all targeting. Uh, to give an example, if you buy my CCIE product." The CCA lab runs on version 9.1. So those labs I give you, they're on 9.1. If you take the, the uh, CCNA, CCMP certifications, those are based on 10.5. So my videos, they're on 10.5. I'm trying to match what, what you actually need to know for the exams. Let's see, looking for any other questions. We'll be wrapping up here in just a few moments. Shane says, how would you, uh, how would you choose the correct host server type for Cisco Unified Communications Manager. Yeah, different server types have different capacities. Like um, some have a capacity of uh, 2,500, some have a capacity of 7,500 IP phones. Uh, you can do some virtualization. There's a matrix out on Cisco's website that that that, that tells you how many, uh, how many IP phones uh, are gonna be supported by each, uh, by, by each of those servers. You might wanna work with your Cisco salesperson, make sure you, you 
you cover your current need, but yet you're planning for the future. I think we've about got everything covered. I'm just doing a quick scan through here. We answered that, we answered that, we answered that. Uh, Adam is saying, what about CUCM and fully qualified domain names? I'm guessing you're talking about the, the DNS reliance. Yeah, you. it'll absolutely work. It works that way by default. If you want to use DNS, you certainly can. You get the little benefit of faster call setup and the little benefit of removing DNS reliance or of not having a single point of failure if you remove it, though. Let's see. Christian says, how did you change the host name to IP? I thought that since 10.5, in conjunction with I am in presence, the host name... Uh, the host name was the best way. Yeah, I am in presence does get integrated with your cluster and notice that it showed up as an IP address. But my publisher showed up as a name. The very first device installed in the cluster get, shows up as a name. It's that server from which I want to remove my DNS reliance. So we've answered that question. We've answered that question. I think we may just about be caught up here. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. When do you recommend getting the server up and running? What do you recommend for getting the server up and running? Um, oh, I'm guessing you're talking about just the initial install. Um, search YouTube. There, there are multiple YouTube videos that, that you're just, it's just walking through a wizard. You can check out uh, plenty of YouTube videos on that. We've answered that one. We've answered that one. Let's see. Missed one here. Do you, uh, doesn't DNS need to be working for IMNP? Uh, ah, great question. Great question. For, I, uh, for the IMN present server, you actually do have to have a DNS server set up. But I, I, and I and I did that, but I only set up that DNS server for I am in presence. You're right. You're right. That's required. You cannot install it without a DNS server. So yes, you're right. That does have to be set up. But in my environment, I'm only using my DNS server for the I am in presence server. Well, I think, I know some people made comments or they chatted. I'm looking for the things with the big question mark next to them. Yeah, looks like we've, uh, looks like we've covered all the questions and we've certainly exhausted our time together. Again, thank you so much. Uh, let, let me give you some more shout outs. Uh, I'm going to give the, uh, I'm going to put the other offer back up here if anybody wants to take advantage of that in the remaining minutes for the ultimate collaboration combo. This includes the CCI if you want to get this one. Let me give some more shout outs to people that just bought. Joseph, uh, Joseph Strouch, looks like. Joseph, my thanks. All right, great, great. And uh, I didn't refresh. Let's see if we got any last second questions. Okay, one, one last question, then we'll wrap it up. Armin's saying, so a cluster of servers is ba basically shared databases when it comes to Communications Manager because for VMware, uh, users can share resources. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the clusters let you, well, not every server in a cluster has to register phones. In a, in a large environment, you might have one server that's just a TFTP server. You might have one server that's uh, that's just a music on hold server. But the servers that can register phones, yes, they share a database. One server, the publisher has a read-write copy of that database. Okay, we are going to go ahead and wrap it up. Again, um, I want to give you a, a huge thank you for joining me for this. Uh, when the uh, when the automated 